And we're back like we never left. Oregon fans, what's going on? How we living? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. I'm your host, Max Torres with Scoop Duck on 3. It is Wednesday, June 5th, 2024, coming to you from Long Beach, California. We got a mailbag edition of the podcast in store for you today. With my guy, Travis Rookley, it has been a minute, but uh, we didn't forget about you guys. Don't worry. I know you love the the mailbag, so I uh, was able to sync up with Travis and get another episode for you guys, the listeners, the readers, the viewers. But before we get into that, the Ducks Dish Podcast is brought to you by Ranchito Grill in Springfield. Not sure what your dinner plans are tonight, but you should head on out to ranchito grill they're at 1537 mohawk boulevard try their homemade tortillas they got great food a great environment and they will take care of you say what's up to my guy ruben and let him know that max torres sent you travis man how we doing it has been quite a while since i last saw you but we have reunited at last yeah man good to be back i'm um, just Weather's getting nicer, starting to get that football itch. Um, I feel like any time you get to this time of year where the, you know, game time start flowing in, early season schedules start materializing a little bit, um, really gets that that excitement going. So just excited to be aboard and talk some ball. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the things have been crazy. You know, I was out in Nashville last week, which was insane. So much fun. And then um, you know, I'm looking for an apartment, looking for a place to live. So, so life just gets a, a little crazy on you sometimes, but glad to, uh, to be back here with you. And, um, I know we got some questions from our readers over at scoop duck. And I think we have one Twitter question. I always put a post out on either Travis or myself. We'll put a post out on scoop duck. Uh, and then we'll also tweet out questions asking for you guys. If you aren't with us over at scoop duck, where you can try us out for a whole month, for just $1, if you're an Oregon football recruiting fan, scoopduck.com is the place to be. So, Travis, with that being said, what do you got for us? Yeah, I mean, and just to just to piggyback on that, like Max and Justin and all these guys have been getting crazy amount of interviews and stuff posted on the site. Um, we've been getting a ton of questions, I know, specifically when it comes to offensive line recruiting. So I know that's a big topic kind of amongst the, the Duck fan base and given where the – you know, depth chart is at right now with a lot of seniors and other people. Um, I think that uh, you completed a couple of interviews this morning that you were going to touch on when it comes to a couple of potential 2025 guys. Absolutely. So let's start off today's episode with offensive line. We're going to talk about one of the very best in the country, and that is 2025 Tampa, Florida, Sumner High School offensive tackle Zaire Addison. He is rated a four-star prospect, according to On3, uh, uh, rated 90 overall, number 287 player nationally, the number 24 offensive tackle, and the number 34 player in the state of Florida, 6'4", 280 pounds. And uh, this is a, a really interesting recruitment to follow, Travis, because he is coming off of recent official visits to Florida and Georgia. And at, from my interview, which will be posted over on Scoop Duck before too long, uh, maybe later today or tonight, uh, this afternoon, we'll have to see. It really does seem like Florida and Georgia kind of set the bar as far as the energy that he saw from the staff. He mentioned that was a, a big takeaway from his trips to Gainesville and Athens, respectively. But he also spoke really highly of Elite Terry and Oregon and how they have been a really big program in his recruitment just for their loyalty. They offered him when he was just a little over 250 pounds and that was something that he mentioned a couple times in the interview. So I think that that is something that could carry some significant weight here. And you know, as well as I do, Travis, when you're recruiting guys out of Florida, being out in Eugene, you look for any advantage that you're able to get. So um, I think that this one still has a ways to go. I think he's trying to decide before his senior season, but for as glowingly as he spoke about Oregon and, he also said that that distance just really isn't a big factor for him. Um, this is a guy I get a feel uh, that really, really enjoys the recruiting process. I mean, he has been all over the country. He's constantly on the road, and, and there's nothing wrong with that by any means. I'd be taking every visit I possibly could if I were in his position. 
but it does make it a little bit harder to get a true pulse on a recruitment. And, and I think to, to differentiate if anyone's really pulling away in this recruitment. So um, Zaire Addison is one of the very best in the country and um, Oregon definitely needs tackle help seeing that Josh Connerly Jr. And Johnny Cornelius are, are entering their last years. Yeah. I mean, just to quickly touch on that piece, I mean, as far as the depth chart goes, I think that, um, I wouldn't be shocked if Connor Lee returned for one more year. Um, you never know. You're right. You never know. He has that. I think that what he needs to work on and develop um, strength wise, depending on how this year goes and what kind of grade he gets, I don't think that's a foregone conclusion as some Duck fans um, like to portray it. Having said that, I mean, we absolutely need to get a tackle or two in this class that's ready pretty early on. And I think Addison is certainly one of those guys. Um, as you said, I mean, I pull, pulling a highly coveted guy out of the South um, is always going to leave me a little bit pessimistic personally. Um, even if you have a guy like Addison who seems to be saying the right things when it comes to distance, not mattering. I just think that, the longer you go in the process and the closer you become to, you know, signing the, the name on the paper, I'm sure you've seen over the days, even in Southern California, you know, the, the lure of home gets stronger and stronger. Um, but I think, or I mean, Oregon landing the staff, they've done anything, everything they can to present themselves in terms of resources, depth chart, coaching, development, ability to win. You're like, I feel like the things we can control, we are in an awesome spot. It's ultimately going to come down to like, is he willing to come uh, that far distance? And at the same time, like, are we, are we willing to offer competitively what he's going to get from some of those other schools in terms of um, NIL? And so I think that we're going to be right there in the game, but I think that as it gets down to it, uh, that's going to be a tough battle. So other schools to keep an eye on for Zaire Addison, looks like he's got an official visit scheduled to Penn State next weekend. June 14th and maybe helping Oregon a little bit here is the fact that uh, another West coast school has emerged a little bit in Addison's recruitment. And, and oddly enough, that's UCLA and uh, UCLA has really, I think generated a new energy on the recruiting trail under new head coach to Foster. And I think I saw someone either on the, like one of the, some other message board or Twitter or whatever. And, and they were asking, when was the last time UCLA had this many commitments in June? So um, I think that that's kind of just another little note to add that uh, Oregon isn't the only West coast school that is on Zaire Addison's radar. And, and I think that that could ultimately be to their benefit in the long run. So don't want to talk too much about one guy. I want to get to the other offensive lineman I was able to talk to. And that was Spanish fork, Utah, Offensive tackle Aaron Dunn, who is just a behemoth uh, of a human being. He is absolutely massive. Uh, I think he's uh, right around six foot seven and um, in the neighborhood of 290, 300 pounds. So, this is another big target for Oregon and Elite Terry. And maybe Travis, we would say he's a more realistic target if, if, uh, if we just want to look at distance alone, because Utah is a state that has been very kind to Oregon in recent years on both sides of the ball, whether that's Jackson powers, Johnson out of corner Canyon winning the Remington trophy and then landing with the Raiders in this most recent NFL draft or Jeffrey Bossa out of Kearns high school. I believe it is uh, on defense at linebacker Noah Sewell being another one, Panay Sewell being another one. If you want to go back to offensive line. So that was something that was big for Aaron Dunn in uh, the recent interview I was able to get with him. He just came off of a recent unofficial visit out to Texas A&M, and that's a bit of a newer school in his recruitment. It seems like they're going to try to squeeze in an official visit out to College Station, but he has two more official visits set up in the month of June to Utah, and he's one of those big visitors that's going to be in town for Oregon's June 21st official visit weekend, and he had a lot of really good things to say about Oregon. I think that his last trip to Oregon in April was his first um, in his recruitment, and um, I think Oregon is still very much alive in this recruitment. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if Aaron Dunn continues to be one of those top guys that we are looking at in, in this recruitment as far as in this class, I should say, for League Terry and the Ducks. So 
Um, I'll have to listen back to the interview again, but uh, very, very positive sentiment from Aaron Dunn as it pertains to Oregon. And, um, you know, physically, he, he's as imposing a prospect as you'll find. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, as you said, I think that um, the proximity certainly helps here. The success there certainly helps here. Um, I mean, two of those guys you mentioned are, you know, Panay, obviously a top 10 pick, uh, JPJ, a top two round pick, those guys specifically from Utah themselves. So I think that, um, you know, the, the things that we have to point, you know, for us in this recruitment are all there. Um, you know, Joe Morse finalist the last two years for our offensive line. Um, clearly the development piece of it is there. Uh, clearly the depth chart piece of it is there. The resources are there. Um, I know duck fans are super worried about where we're at. And I definitely, if there was one point of concern, I share that with them. But I think at the same time, when you just look at those pieces I touched on and where we've been at in the recent years with them, there's no reason to believe, um, this year is going to be any different. I just think that like offensive line recruiting has proven to be kind of a different animal um, in this day and age. Um, commitment timelines are different. Resources allocation is different. There just seems to be a different vibe with offensive line recruiting than almost any other position. I don't know if you kind of feel the same way. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's especially tackle, right? I think it's really become one of those premium positions that are really in high demand and you can look even for an example just look at this last transfer portal cycle like that there weren't necessarily there, there typically aren't a lot of high profile offensive linemen or high profile tackles in particular that are in the transfer portal which is exactly why adrian clem a couple cycles ago made rhode islands Johnny Cornelius, his top priority. And that was such a big win for the Ducks because you look at him, he comes in, slots right in as a starter there at right tackle for the Ducks. So I think with with, um, with the offensive tackle in particular, I think those guys really understand the market that they have and the draw that they have with a lot of these top programs. I mean, you can get you get a guy like an Aaron Dunn. I don't know. He a lot of this tape is at right tackle, so I'm not necessarily sure if he projects to be a right or left tackle. But like with a tackle, you get those guys, and it's like, hey, you get me, and I'll protect your quarterback's blind side for the next four years. So that's just obviously a, a very common talking point, but uh, it's one that obviously makes a lot of sense, and it's why you see offensive line recruiting kind of being in that uh, upper tier or different animal that you mentioned, Travis. Yeah. And it's always going to be, you know, more of a development of developmental position in that way. I think that I've heard, you know, there's an adage I know in a lot of college football circles, you know, you fi sign five to six each cycle and hope two to three pan out. Um, and with this, you know, with the portal now and so much more roster movement, I think it almost makes that a cleaner process where it's like, you know, you have guys in, the, you know, in the HDC and you see after a year or two, they're not going to develop into the guy you wanted to and find a new spot for him and bring in some new guys. So I think that um, between those two names you mentioned, I know Jay hop posted some juice today that mentioned a couple other candidates that were visiting soon and possibly on the radar. Um, Ducks are going to be in a fine spot. And as we saw with Cornelius, like, yeah, it's, it's, you're going to have to be at the top of the list to find a guy in the portal if you need him, but there's no reason to believe that won't, that we won't be at the top of that list if we do need it. Um, so um, duck fans can can sleep easy i think for a couple months here and let's see where things shake out exactly so make sure you guys check out the juice if you haven't already that's uh justin's premier recruiting feature and then mine's usually taurus's take so um we try to keep our readers as informed as possible and june's been a big month so far and and this june will will lay the groundwork for for what's to come in july uh and go a long way in determining how oregon's 2025 class shapes out but uh Travis, what you got next for us? Yeah, well, might as well stay on that topic a little bit. Another recruiting-related question um, that touched on the OL, too. Um, how much does track and field play into Foster, meaning Bryce Foster's recruitment? And then how much does baseball play into Jonah Williams? Um, I feel like I can probably touch on the first, and you don't mind going into the second a little bit. I know with Foster, I mean, track's always been 1A, 1B with him. I remember him um, coming out of high school. That was a huge selling piece for our program. Um, and I think it still does remain that way today. I don't think it's an accident that he's visiting when we're hosting a big track meet, I believe this weekend. Um, 
I could be wrong, but I believe it is. He's coming again to town um, to see that. So I think, long story short, that's a big piece of it. And I think if you can bring in a guy like that, a depth piece on the offensive line that is probably coming as a walk-on as well, um, that's a slam dunk to me. That'd obviously be a big uh, a big win for Oregon if they're ultimately able to to land Bryce Foster. And based on some of the recent conversations I've had with, with people close to the program, it, it seems like Oregon's feeling pretty good about their their chances with Foster. I don't think Travis, I've seen any other schools linked to him uh, amid his recruitment the second time around now, obviously in the transfer portal. And if you're thinking about track, there, there's not too many schools that are going to be able to beat Oregon in, in that regard. And I think if you can hypothetically add a guy like Bryce Foster, you get some depth at center in case anything happens to Poncho and, and just overall some depth on the interior of your offensive line. So uh, that's a win-win situation as far as I'm concerned. And then going over to Jonah Williams, uh, if you don't know Jonah Williams, 2025 five-star safety out of Galveston, Texas, Ball High School. Uh, this is one of the biggest wants in Oregon's 2025 recruiting class, specifically at safety. Uh, I just wrote a snapshot story for Oregon's 2025 recruiting, safe, uh, safety recruiting that is uh, over on the site. And I basically talked about how the Ducks need to sign an elite safety this class. They got one in Aaron Flowers last year, and they also supplemented that with Kingston Lopa and Peyton Woodyard. But I feel like they've gotten a little bit reliant on the transfer portal for safety in the past couple of cycles. And I think they want to get away from that. And the way that you get away from that is getting the guy like Jonah Williams on board. So to, to the mailbag question, it's huge. Uh, baseball is huge in Jonah Williams' recruitment. And the quote I got from him at on three elite in Nashville was that it's 50, 50 between baseball and football. He said he was talking to Mark Wazikowski almost every day. So they have a really good relationship. The relationships there, uh, Oregon's playing in the super regional uh, coincidentally against Texas A&M, who I believe is probably the leader for Jonah Williams right now. His brother, older brother, Nick, signed with the Aggies to play baseball before he was drafted by the Philadelphia Phillies. I can't remember the year. I want to say it was 2017, but I could be a little rusty there. So, um, you know, if you're an Oregon baseball fan, maybe root a little bit harder because uh, the farther they go, the, the better the baseball program looks. And, and that's definitely going to be uh, a huge factor with Jonah Williams, who has a uh, legitimate MLB draft uh, aspirations and potential um, based on just kind of the chatter and the the whispers that I heard out of Nashville. It seems like he's a first three round type of guy. Yeah, well, you got to hope a guy like Bryce Betcher puts on a little show this weekend, proves to him uh, the baseball football combo can work. Um, yeah, I mean, he's similar to the conversation we had about Addison earlier. I mean, I think the staff give them credit. I think they've done everything they possibly can to be in the game there with him. Um, I think we'll be competitive. I think we'll be in it till the end. Am I going to bet on Oregon right now where things are at? Probably not. But, um, you know, as guys like to say, keep chipping away and we'll see where things land um, as it gets into the fall. Yeah, you just got to keep going. I think that there's still a, a decent runway in, in Jonah Williams' recruitment. He didn't have a decision timeline that he was able to reference, and, and maybe that's for the better for Oregon. Uh, keep an eye out for Jonah Williams. He started off his official visits last weekend in Los Angeles, out my way at USC, but he's going to be getting back out to Eugene. I think he's the June 14th weekend. He could be the 21st. I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head, but uh, he's going to be back in Eugene this weekend for an official visit, and uh, it's an opportunity for Oregon to build on previous momentum because he was on campus just before the On3 Elite Series uh, in late May, which is a positive development for Chris Hampton and the Ducks. For sure, for sure. All right, um, next question. When Oregon and Ohio State run on the field at Autzen on October 12th, what do you think each team will be ranked, and who do you think will be favored? Um, I'll give you a little schedule background here. So I just looked at Ohio State's schedule just to confirm what I thought. And so Oregon and Ohio State both have three – non we'll say non-power four non-conference games and then ohio state goes at michigan state iowa at home and we go at ucla michigan state at home so looks pretty favorable to me um what do you think yeah i think it looks very favorable for, for oregon um and, and ohio state as far as just the the road ahead and the schedule that they have before they face off in eugene on uh, october 12th which Travis, I mean, everyone's kind of talking about it, right? This has game of the year 
potential uh, based on how both of the teams have done in the transfer portal and in the high school rankings. They both break in new quarterbacks in Dylan Gabriel at Oregon and Will Howard at Ohio State. Carlos Lachlan is now on the Ohio State staff. Chip Kelly is now on the Ohio State staff. So I don't think that Oregon and Ohio State ha have ever been linked or tied this closely together uh, in recent years, except for, of course, their 2014 matchup, uh, 2015 matchup, I guess, in the national championship and the debut of the four team playoff. So it seems, Travis, like both of these teams are probably going to be undefeated going into that game in mid October, um, probably both safely inside the top 10. And um, I don't know. I think if this game was in Columbus, I think I would say that Ohio state is surely going to be favored, but it's in Eugene. So I don't know. I mean, if, if Oregon takes care of business, you would think that they would probably be the likely favorite, but um, I don't know if I'm confident enough in the national narrative and the uh, national love for the ducks compared to how most people out West probably feel about the ducks. For sure. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I was just looking over at Georgia's schedule and, you know, they've got both Clemson and uh, Alabama before that weekend. And I'm just thinking with most preseason projections I've seen, we've been us and Ohio state have been anywhere from two to four um, in that range with Texas in there as well. So we're a Georgia loss away and possibly needing a Texas one to Michigan away from that game being one versus two, uh, which is just crazy to think about the environment that that game would bring being a one versus two matchup. So um, I don't know. I can't wait. I think most early lines I've seen have ducks, maybe ducks minus one or two. Um, just given the home field advantage you mentioned. Um, what I think that typically means is on a neutral site, Ohio State's probably a slight favorite. Um, I think that makes sense to me, but I think it'll certainly matter what those teams look like in the run-up to it, and obviously health being a big factor too. But, man, the, if the ticket markets reflect anything, that is going to be a heck of a freaking game. Yeah, it's definitely going to be. I haven't even looked at flights yet. I'm probably going to try to crash with my buddies uh, – jacob that uh, i lived with when i was out there in eugene so i might be sleeping on a floor uh that weekend but um i really don't care as long as i can get out to eugene and, and hopefully cover that game and, and be there for an all-timer so um that's going to be a fun one for sure and um i think that both teams have question marks but um i don't know for as dominant as ohio state has been it seems like ryan day's seat is a uh, a little warmer uh, than maybe you would expect. I'm not saying he's on the hot seat. I didn't say those words, but we all know the standard at Ohio State and Michigan, that team up north, has uh, clearly had their number these past couple of years, and that doesn't really fly with the folks in Columbus. Getting a, getting a little toasty for sure up there. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be a fun one. I'm 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 uh, excited to see how the Ducks fare in that one, and and obviously we're going to be talking about that one a whole lot more as the season gets closer. Yep. Yep. Um, let's just stay along that same vein. Cause I think it, um, kind of relates to that past question. Um, in all your years following the ducks football team, where does this team rank in terms of their chances to win it all? Yeah. So Travis, I know you've been following the ducks longer than I have, you know, you're obviously a, a Eugene native, so you have that one over me, uh, for people who don't know, I mean, I didn't really start following the ducks, like really closely until 2014, probably when I was in high school. Uh, maybe 2013. Uh, my sister went to Oregon and she graduated in 2017. So obviously we would go up uh, every year for a game. I didn't go to my first Oregon game until I was in the fourth grade. Uh, I'm 26 right now. So that kind of just gives you a little bit of a feel of uh, how old I am. And the first game was against Cal and they fumbled out of the end zone and lost. So um, that's kind of cool how uh, that was the first Oregon game that I went to, uh, but they definitely grabbed my attention. So um, I mean, 2014, that was a year where after a couple games, I think you just saw the Ducks were for real with with Mariota obviously running things um, and, and the defense that they had with Defoe and Eric Armstead and uh, some of their defensive backs. Um, so it kind of just felt like 2014 was like, OK, how many points are the Ducks going to win by this week? Um, that's like just how good they were. So I'd say this is probably... I mean, in terms of a roster and the potential to win it all, I think it's right up there. But the road to that is, is I think, significantly more difficult. Um, and 
not to come off as a pessimist. I'm just telling this, this is how I feel. Like I'm really confident in this Oregon team, but I don't think enough people are talking about the actual road Travis to win all of it because the expanded playoff means more high quality games, more tough games. And it's ultimately more games that you have to win to ultimately capture that ever elusive first national championship. Yeah, no, I mean, the, I think the clear caveat there is just the difference in structures as we've gone along. You know, I some of my first memories, 2000, 2001, obviously, 2001 team, 2007. Um, what What's unique about those years, 2010, is, you know, it was just a single title game. Make the title game, win the game, you're the champ. So um, you go from there, you know, obviously that 2010 game is – etched in all of our minds then you go up to those years you mentioned you know 2014 being in it um and some of the past years being right there uh with a 14 playoff but obviously now i mean even if you're one of those first round buys you know those are those are competitive you know winning winner you're out games um even if it's a one versus an eight nine matchup a one versus a four five in the semis you know those are those are going to be battles um so i think in terms of scheduling, it's definitely gotten harder. I think in terms of where's this team ranked in terms of their chance to win it all roster wise, I agree with you. I mean, I don't know that we've ever had a better roster one to 85, um, but I think obviously the schedule piece of it means a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's So there's a lot of factors that, that come into all of it. I know when I was talking with Jeff Schwartz um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe it's coming up on a month ago. I'm not even sure I do so many of these. I can't keep track. He was talking about how um, he was maybe a little bit more skeptical because Lanning um, doesn't have a ton of experience as a head coach. Um, And and again, I don't think he was saying that in a critical way, um, saying that he's not a good coach. It's just he hasn't necessarily been there before as a head coach. We all know he won a national title with Georgia and he's been at Alabama. So I think that was kind of my con- my contribution to, to that point was uh, maybe he hasn't been a head coach for as long as some of these other people have at the uh, top of the sport. But, uh, you know, his resume, his pedigree, uh, I don't think you can ask for, for a much better uh, in that regard. So I think that uh, all the ingredients are certainly there. Yep, yep, 100%. Um, Always one of my favorite questions to look at and address and topic. Um, if you could bring one home and one away Oregon uniform combo from the Pac-12 years with you to the Big Ten, which would it be? Ooh. These are tough. I know we were talking a little bit about this one before we hit record. Um, it doesn't quite feel like Oregon has um, home and away uniforms. Um, so I'm just going to go with two of my favorites that were from the Pac-12 era. Um, they definitely saw a resurgence this year and deservedly so, but I love the retros, uh, the pick uniforms, um, with, with the yellow helmet and then the green UO on the side. And then, um, another one that I've always really, really loved Travis is the, um, I think it was the 2012 Rose bowl uniforms, the forest green with the Chrome lids. Um, I, I really loved those. I think those are some of my favorites, uh, I want to see Oregon do more forest green this year. I feel like they haven't really leaned into that in a while. And, and it's one of the cool combos because it just leans into that Pacific Northwest identity, the outdoors, the nature, the green. So uh, I think those would probably be two of the ones up there for me. How about you? Yeah, hundred percent agree on the forest green. I'm, I'm team forest over Apple any day. Um, but no one seems to want to listen to me. Um, I don't know. I got three that I loved. I love the the black Jordans that we debuted. I was always hoping we'd come out with like a white version, but I think just throwing that Jordan symbol on there was um, fans, players, everyone loved that. Um, black Jordans for sure. I think. I mean, you're an you're a Southern California guy. Um, the classic Stormtrooper, like from the 2010, 2012, down at USC that we'd wear every year. Um, I don't know if it's just the fact that I have such fond memories of that game and those games, but yeah, heck right there. If you're watching on video, like watching Barner run for 321 yards in those uniforms, um, those will just always have like a special place in my heart. Just thinking about um, just kind of like flip, I, you know, growing up USC was always the, you know, big bad bully. Um, 
and having that flip um, and then just having like those iconic uniforms that were super special to that time. I always think about and lastly, I think this uniform doesn't get enough credit because the game was horrible, but the duck uniforms, the like with the little orange cleats and socks against Colorado 2016, I think it was um, horrible game. Horrendous horrible game. Um, terrible fade by Prukop to end the game, but I actually think the uniforms are nice. I like those two. I like those two. I think that the perception would be a lot different had they been able to get a win in that game, Travis. But uh, I didn't, I hate to cut it short, but I got I to gotta jet. I got to get out of here. Um, so if you guys want to find more of Travis, you can follow him on Twitter slash X at Travis Rookley, that name right there on your screen. Also check him out at Ducks Rising, Duck Rising, uh, with all the stuff that they're doing over there, getting things going. If you want to find more of me, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at MTorres Sports. Subscribe to the Scoop Duck YouTube channel, and like it says there on the bottom, come see us at Scoop Duck. Try us out for just one dollar. I think it's well worth the price. And uh, share the show, share the Ducks Dish podcast with your friends, with your family, with other Duck fans. But until next time, thank you guys for stopping by. Thank you to Travis for coming on. And we'll see you in the next episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast.